it's March, which means around here that uh, many of you probably stood in line in 20 above weather, which is pretty good this winter, uh, to get Dairy Queen this last week. And the Moorhead Dairy Queen opened on March 1st, and you got to enjoy a cold treat on a cold day. Only in North Dakota, Minnesota does that happen, right? The other thing about March that we're all so excited about, many of us, I imagine, is March Madness. It's basketball tournament time. Lots of different ages, uh, lots of different tournaments going on. There's going to be many upsets. There's going to be some Cinderella stories. There already has been uh, lots of victory and excitement there. Uh, my brother Ben Jacobson is the head coach for the University of Northern Iowa Panthers, a Division I school in Iowa, and he uh, leads the men's basketball team there. He's got a, a star player. His name is AJ. And A.J. Green, uh, he came to you and I as the number 74th, uh, according to ESPN, recruits in the nation when he was a senior in high school. A.J. ranked in the top 100 of recruits in the nation. And his first two years, he started every single game at you and I. His third season, he started the first three games and then had a season-ending hip injury that he was done for the season. He had to spend months in recovery, uh, super defeating for him uh, and the team. He came back then this year in his second junior year and has been playing amazingly, doing an incredible job. So just last week, they competed for the championship game to get the number one seed in the regular season in their conference, in the Missouri Valley Conference. They're playing Loyola, and let me paint the picture of the end of the game. So there's 27 seconds left. A.J. Green is at the free throw line, and it's a one and one, and so that means that if he makes the first free throw, then he gets another one. If he misses the first free throw, he doesn't get to shoot the second one. And he's at the free throw line, and get this. He had made 28 straight free throws in the game, so... Uh, it's like the end of February when this game was happening. He hadn't missed a free throw since January in a game setting. That's incredible. It's very unlikely that that happens for someone who consistently shoots free throws in a game. So he had made 28 straight free throws. He's at the line. There's 27 seconds left in regulation in the game. It's a one and one He misses the free throw. Misses the free throw. Loyola gets the rebound. They go down. They run the clock down. They get a last shot. They miss it. Tie game goes into overtime. Can you imagine what A.J. Green is thinking as he goes into the timeout? The truth is they could have won the game in regulation if he had made that free throw. Game could have been over. Now they got to play five more minutes. He comes out in overtime, gets fouled, makes two free throws. Next possession, he makes a like step back three pointer, swishes it. It was incredible. It was amazing to watch. Five points right off the bat. They end up winning the game. Uh, the team played great towards the end. It was fantastic to watch. They got the number one seed in their conference. Why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because A.J. Green not only showed mental toughness and grit, he showed a lot of resilience. Coming back from a season-ending injury, major hip surgery, coming back after a missed free throw, if he had spent a second thinking about that missed free throw, do you think he could have came back? and done what he did? Probably not. It is a story of resilience. And over the next five weeks, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about resilience in such a way that it requires training. It is a skill that we can learn, and it requires training, just like AJ, coming back from those things, the injury and the missed free throw. Resilience is a refining process. It is a skill that requires training when we are under high stress and pressure in our life. And so I looked up the Webster's Dictionary definition of resilience to kind of get us going with this idea and this mindset of resilience. It means the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. I think you and I, if we pause for just a couple seconds, could think of moments in our own life that we've had to show resilience that we've had the, to figure out and come up with the capacity to make it through, come back and recover quickly from difficulties 
or tough times. I believe that Midwesterners are some of the most resilient people. Some of that has to do, I believe, with our ancestry, which really stems from an agriculture and a farming background, that there's this grit and this hard work ethic. The other thing that proves itself true in terms of resiliency is the Fargo flood. Uh, we had many years there where all of us just pulled together and we did everything that we could to sandbag, to either fill up sandbags or go sandbag to save homes and businesses. See, our community, it's already naturally resilient. Our upper Midwest mentalities, they already lean towards this really quickness to recover from difficulty, a quickness to rally together and, and to really uh, pull each other up in the midst of trial. So our community is already naturally resilient, but what about, that poses the question for me and for us today, what about being followers of Christ? What about when you and I make the decision to follow Jesus? Should our resilience look any different? Should there be any difference in the way that we choose to respond or the, cho the way that we choose to live in terms of just resilience that's maybe different than what we even already naturally have as a community? And I know that there's many of you that you're maybe just checking out church for the first time. You're watching online and this is one of the first times that you've connected to church either ever or for many, many years. Some of you have been coming for just a few months, and, and if you're honest, you're, just, you're not quite sure about the place that God has in your life. You haven't taken a step to invite Jesus into your life, and then there's many of us that have taken that step, that have said that the core of our life and our belief is that Jesus, the Son of God, that God sent his one and only Son, Jesus, to this earth to live fully human and fully God, that he would be on this earth and he would teach during his time and he would, he would encourage people to follow, not because of the power that was in him as Jesus Christ, but the, the power of God the Father alongside. And that then he would die a brutal death for our sins, to cover the gap of our sins so we could have relationship with our Heavenly Father. And there's a point in the Gospels, it's the Gospel of John, and that's in the New Testament. They tell a story about Jesus, and, and there's a point that Jesus is talking to his disciples, his closest followers, and he's explaining to them, and he's saying, hey guys, I'm not always going to be here. And he's explaining, hey, but you know what I want you to know is, it's actually going to be better when I leave. And for them, they're thinking, are you kidding me? We, can, we can't do this without you. And Jesus is saying, hang on though. You don't know what's about to happen. Because when I leave to go be with God the Father, he's going to send an advocate in my place. And the advocate is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can live in you. And Jesus was telling his disciples, he's saying, hey guys, it's going to be better. Because it's not like I'm just with you, like as they got to experience him as like fully human and be beside him and walk with him and be able to feel him physically. He's saying, guess what? The Holy Spirit has the same power I do and that's going to live in you when you receive me into your life. And what I want to tell you today is that if you've made that choice to follow Jesus, that is the power that you have living within you. You have the power of the Holy Spirit that can lead and guide you. You have Jesus with you every single day. And I think it's so important that you and I don't take that lightly or take it for granted. And it really matters when it comes into this conversation about resilience because resilience, because of that, because of that, resilience is so much more than just bouncing back. It is so much more than just bouncing back from difficulty. See, this belief is the core and foundation of our faith. And so I'm going to share a definition that we're going to move through this five-week series with about resilience that is different than a cultural 
definition, and it's this. Resilience is the result of a heart grounded in our identity in Christ. An identity in Christ, that probably sounds like, oh, what does that mean? Let me unpack that just a little bit. What does it really mean to have your identity in Christ? What it means is, is believing and receiving. That guess what? God knows everything about you. He knows everything about your past. He knows everything about your present. He knows everything about your future. And I know if we sat in that for a second, it it could get really complicated. You could choose to make that, that whole idea and thought really complicated. But let me tell you simply, God knows everything about you. And he loves you with it all, deeply. And our part is just to simply receive that. And when you and I receive that there is a God who loves us with all of us, every single part of us, we become rooted and grounded in our identity in Christ. And there is a humble confidence that comes along with the way that we walk our life when we receive that we are a child of God and our identity is rooted in that. Over the Last several weeks, I've heard stories right here at Prairie Heights of people. Let me just share a couple. Uh, There's one couple that's dating, and I've had the chance to come alongside in some ways and pray for them, and, and here's a little of their story. Each of them have had previous marriages, and there's a lot of hurt and pain and a lot of things that weren't godly in both of those relationships, and, and then these two meet And man, I just see it in them. They're trying to do everything they can to live a life that's centered with God. Live a life that's honoring to God and their relationship. They just are passionate about God being the center of their relationship. As they engage in being part of a church family, as they pray together, as they respect and honor one another. But here's the thing that's getting exposed in each of their lives. They are terrified to get married again. They are terrified to get married again, and it has nothing to do with what's going on in their relationship. It has everything to do with their past. I heard a story the other week of a couple teenagers who are being bullied for the way that they look, and one of them who's getting bullied for just a choice that they made one day. And my question about those stories is, what kind of training do they have to bounce back from those life circumstances? And that's what I want to uncover today is that resilience, there is so much more than just bouncing back. Sometimes it is too difficult to just bounce back from hurt. What kind of training are, have we been provided to be able to have the type of resilience that can help us navigate and heal and walk through some of the more difficult parts of our life? See, what I believe is that what you and I choose to focus on after a failure, after a miss, after a mistake, what we choose to focus on after that, it's what sets us apart. And if I'm to talk to just the people who are following Jesus, if you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, there's a whole lot of grace that is offered in that walk. And I also want to say Our life following Jesus means we should live different than how our culture is living. There are some things in our life that should feel and look countercultural because of our belief and our hope that is unwavering in our relationship with Jesus. And what you and I choose to focus on after a failure, after a miss, it's what sets us apart. And our relationship with Jesus is one of those things that sets us apart. And so the core of this entire series is this. Resilience training builds our spiritual strength. Resilience training builds our spiritual strength. Let me unpack that just a little bit further. See, because human resilience says what? It says, I can do it. Just work harder. Just be better. Just pull up your bootstraps. I can do it. That's what human resilience would would tell us, right? But listen, godly resilience, 
godly resilience says, you can't do it alone. It says, I can't do it alone. And what God reminds us in a godly resilience is he says, I am with you. I am for you and I am with you every step of the way through the best days of your life and through the the low points of your life. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It is said multiple times throughout scripture. Jesus even said, he's telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to leave, but I'm telling you it's going to be better because you will have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so if you're a follower of Christ today, you've got to recognize you have the power of Jesus with you every single day, and that's a difference maker. That's godly resilience. See, godly resilience always comes back to who God is and who God is to you and your identity in Christ. What does that look like? I can imagine many of you are starting to process. What does that practically look like in your life today? Because God says he is with us in the pain, and he is with us through every trial. Not because, and we don't get through those things. Again, this is the shift. This is countercultural. This is different than what a lot of voices in our culture would tell us. We do not get through those things because of our human resilience and our human resilient strength, but because of who we are in Christ and what Christ can do that we can't do on our own. Over the next five weeks, we are going to focus on biblical leaders throughout the Old Testament who faced extremely difficult circumstances, who were thrown into unthinkable challenges. And guess what? They came out more resilient, not because of who they were, not because of the, the power and the strength that they could muster up in themselves. No, they became more resilient because of how they trusted God and how they leaned on God. And I can't wait to unpack over the next five weeks. We're going to see how they gained a stronger faith, a stronger character, a deeper dependence on God in the midst of fear and anxiety and heartache and challenge. And we're going to do that, and I can't wait for that. But today, today we're going to keep talking about why. Why is this resilience training so important? There are two critical reasons why we need resilience training. Uh, we need resilience training because, number one, increasing our trust in God decreases our reliance on self. I heard this story just this last week. It's two guys on an airplane. And one of the guys, he's just talking about relationships he has in his life and some trust that he's been building with a friend and with his spouse, and he was excited about that. And, and the guy next to him, he kind of scoffed at him. And he said, I don't trust anybody. I don't trust anything. And the guy who was sharing his story and being vulnerable with his story, he turned to him and he said, you know we're on an airplane, right? (laughs) He said, you got on this airplane and you trusted the pilot to get us safely to our destination. And he started telling this other guy, he said, every day when you get in your car, You are trusting that your car is going to get you safely to your destination. Every day when you eat something that's been packaged, you are trusting every single person who has been a part of that packaging process that what you're about to eat is safe. Isn't it true? You and I, we trust people and we trust something all the time. We're always placing our trust in something or someone. The question becomes, who? Who are you choosing to place your trust in? Because when we increase our trust in God, it decreases our trust in self. And we're going to dig in a little bit to a prophet in the Old Testament. And when I'm going to talk Old Testament mostly throughout this series. And so let me just say real quick, uh, the Bible is filled with 66 books written by many different authors. It's in two different sections, and the two sections are the Old Testament, the New Testament. Old Testament is everything before Jesus. 
New Testament is everything about Jesus' life in the four Gospels and then after that. So when I say the Old Testament, we're going to dig in today a prophet. His name is Jeremiah. And what, were, what was the prophet's role in the Old Testament? The prophet's role was a kingdom after kingdom that was ruled by kings. And the culture there was just full of sin. And everybody was turning from God. So many people in that culture were not living with God in their life. And so God would send a prophet to speak godly things, to remind them of who God was, to try to draw people close to God. And Jeremiah was one of those prophets. And Jeremiah happened to walk a lonely road. A road where, like I said, God was asking him to be the spokesperson for the kingdom of Judah and to call people out, to ask them to turn from their sin, talk about resilience, God says, Jeremiah, you go and you speak this. And, and what I want you to hear is that Jeremiah lived a life full of it as he spoke. Get this. Nobody listened. Have you ever been there? Where, and maybe you're a parent and you see something ahead for your kids and you try to speak life into them and they aren't listening. Or maybe you're just trying to help a friend and you speak something and they don't listen. Have you been there where no, one's, no, one's, no one seems to be listening to you? That was Jeremiah. God was asking him to speak up. And so he was being obedient to God, but nobody was listening. Yet what we're about to read in the book of Jeremiah that he writes that's so powerful, we're going to look at his writing and he depicts such a great contrast of what it looks like to trust people versus what it looks like to trust God. And so in Jeremiah 17, 5 and 6, and then again in, and then in 7 and 8, we're going to see a side by side. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. I want us to stop and pause for a second. I'm going to read that one more time. They will not see prosperity when it comes. Isn't it interesting that when you and I are placing our trust in things, and even when we place too much trust just on our own self-reliance, what happens is even when prosperity comes, we don't see it. We're so distracted that we don't see it, and that's what Jeremiah is saying. He's saying, they will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in the assault land where no one lives. What I hear from this first couple of verses from Jeremiah, he's saying, your life's going to be empty, and your life's going to be dry. Those last couple, four sentences about, those are the results of what? Go back to the first two. Cursed is the one who trusts in man who trusts in other people. Now, we need to trust other people. That's a whole different topic. What he's talking about, though, is when you choose to trust other people above trusting God, who draws strength from mere flesh, and then he talks about uh, when your heart turns away from the Lord, what does that begin to look like in your life? And the results of that are empty, and they're dry. But then, Jeremiah says... But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. We just had a year of drought, literally. I come from a farming family, and so there are days that that caused anxiety or fear when we were thinking about it from a self-reliant place. But I'll tell you, there are many days, too, in our house where we just said, we're going to trust God with it. We know he's going to do something through it. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. What does that feel like? So the first, you look at the first set of verses, and it feels empty and dry. And then you listen to the second set of verses and it feels full and alive. What's the difference? The only difference is who are you trusting? Where are you placing your trust? See, because in times of trouble, those who trust in people or themselves will be left impoverished, will be left spiritually weak. They will have no strength to draw on. 
And I'm telling you, this shift, this countercultural shift about reliance, this idea that human reliance says, I can do it, but godly resilience says, you can't do it alone. This shift is spiritual maturity. And the more we choose to increase our self-reliance, it decreases our trust in God. It's the opposite of what I just said. That increasing our trust in God decreases our reliance on self. It is so important that you and I take a look at our life to say, where are the pockets that I'm being self-reliant? That I need to increase my trust in God. And here's the thing for many of us, this is not a new concept. This is, this is not new. What I am telling you, the words I am saying, trust God. That is not new. In some way, shape, or form, you maybe have heard that year after year after year, but why then is it so hard for us to live it out? Why then do we need to learn this lesson over and over and over and over again? And simply put, the reason is because there's sin in our world And sin damages relationships. Sin divides homes. Sin divides communities. Sin divides. But what I want to talk about, because I want to go a little bit deeper, and I want to explain there's another dynamic to this that might even just help, depending on your story and depending on how you grew up, it might help you process, uh, one, how awesome God is, (laughs) And two, it might help you give yourself a little bit of grace as you begin to make this shift and walk this road of becoming spiritually strong. Uh, Research shows that our ability or lack thereof, really, to trust actually stems back to the time when we were kids. There's a medical doctor, his name's Dr. Kurt Thompson, and he spent his career focused on understanding the science of the brain and how it connects to our soul and our spiritual life in his book, Anatomy of the Soul. So he explains this idea that without a trusting and dependable relationship from a mom or a dad at a very young age or a loving adult who you can trust to take care of you and give you your basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, the things that that you need in a trusting emotional relationship, And if you are faced at a young age with a stressful or traumatic event, what actually happens as designed by God is that your brain, our brains in that stressful event will actually start to fragment. And the reason for that is that fragmentation will actually help us survive the event and get through it. And here's what's absolutely fascinating is that as, as you dig in uh, to this study and more about this topic, he's not the only author and doctor to dig into it. What's so fascinating is that the way that the brain actually begins to reintegrate, to become whole again, one of the ways that can happen is when we build our spiritual strength, when we increase our trust in God. And he talks about, specifically in this book, how for many people, when they begin to read God's word, and read the story of God, they can begin to trust who God is and trust his character, that he will be consistent and it begins to build a bonded, trusting relationship with their heavenly father that they didn't have here on earth. And that process actually begins to reintegrate the brain. Isn't that fascinating that God actually made our physical being, our mental being, our spiritual, emotional being to be resilient in this life. See, we all have experiences, um, and we've all experienced some type of brokenness in our life, haven't we? We can all point to a time, you know the saying, rock bottom, meaning like, I hope this is it. Maybe you've hit rock bottom before. Maybe you've got someone in your life that you're praying, I pray, God, this is their rock bottom, that this is it, and they're going to turn from where they're headed, and they're going to start to make different choices in their life. Well, I took a second this last week, and I, I just processed for a moment. I, I kind of 
processed all of our staff at Prairie Heights and I started to think about their stories and think about what God has done in their life and my life. And, and I came up with some thematic things that we've shared in life experience that have been some of our rock bottom. So they include this, uh, the painful loss of many babies through pregnancy loss, through stillbirth, through medical complications at days or weeks old. Uh, many of us have been caught in the life of addiction and abuse cycles that have found us just surviving our life one day at a time. Many of us have been tricked and tempted to believe that money or status will one day give us the joy that we so desperately desire. I don't know, what's your rock bottom? See, all of our rock bottoms might look a little different. But you know what's common? You know what we have in common when we talk about the idea of rock bottom? It doesn't matter what the idea, uh, the details of that rock bottom experience are. What matters is, as I think about the stories of the, the amazing people that I get to be in ministry with on a full-time basis, I think about at one place or another, each and every one of us made a choice to not stay where we were at and to begin to trust God more than we trusted ourselves. And so for you, where you're at today, and it's a journey, it's a journey. That doesn't mean that we all have it figured out at all, that there are days that we take control back, but increasing our trust in God decreases our reliance on self. And for you, when you hit those moments, where does your trust go? See, because we can hold on and cling to the securities of our culture. Money, Instagram followers, latest fashion, size of our house or car, we can cling to those things or we can live in such a way that tells God, even if you took all this away, I'd be okay. See, because we need to understand that spiritual strength actually equals surrender. And isn't it funny? In our culture, we would not hear strength equals surrender, would we? It's countercultural. Jesus came to help us understand that the way to follow him is countercultural. And spiritual strength equals surrender. And that means giving of your life, surrendering your life, being fully dependent on God. And if the things of your life were wiped away, would you still be okay? You know, for me, I absolutely love my call here. I love that uh, I get to be a part of what God is doing here at Prairie Heights. And I've had many different experiences throughout the years. And in this season that God allows me the privilege and honor and as a church family that that I get to be our lead pastor in this season. And I love it. I'm so passionate. I can't wait for our future and all that God wants to do through us. And I got to tell you that deep down in my soul, I know that my identity is not in the title lead pastor. And so if my role was to change tomorrow and I got to do something else around here, or if for some reason I was unable to do this role anymore, I'd be okay. Because it's not my identity. Now, I love it. I am so passionate. I care so deeply about the purposes that God has to do through my life. And so what are those things that you care so deeply about that are just in you, that you would give anything, that you sacrifice time and talent and you give to financially? What are those things in your life? I don't know what they are for you, but what are those things and if those things were to change, would you still be okay? That's the resilience that I'm talking about. The resilience that is rooted in a foundation of your relationship with Jesus and your identity that only comes from Christ. That when you hit difficult moments in your life, that you know that you are going to be able to sustain when life gets crazy. Because you are rooted 
your heart is rooted and grounded in your identity in Christ. So why do we need resilience training to build spiritual strength? Because number one, increasing our trust in God decreases our self-reliance. And number two, increasing God's voice quiets all other voices. It's 1999, and I've got my Patriot jersey on. I'm an eighth grader, 13 years old. I'm the starting point guard for the high school team, uh, Class B, Mayville, Portland, Clifford, Galesburg. Uh, don't get too excited. I mean, they didn't have a lot of people to choose from, so that's why at eighth grade I was able to play in that role. Uh, no, but we had a great team. We had a couple six-footers, which was uh, ideal and very rare. And we were playing our rivals, Hatton. And we were in Hatton, North Dakota. We're in the gym. Small gym, three sides of it. One side uh, had the stage that bleachers were set up on. Two sides had bleachers. Uh, one wall, and then there were two doors that were open to the cafeteria, and it was packed. The cafeteria was packed, and they couldn't even see the court. The whole gym was packed. Everybody was standing the entire game to give you more of an idea of the environment. When you stood out of bounds to take the ball out of bounds, your back was hitting the wall because there's like that much space between the out of bounds line and the wall. So small gym, packed, loud as can be. I'm an eighth grader, and I'm, they played this crazy full court press, and they got us turnover after turnover all the time. And so it's about middle of the game, uh, second half, and I'm sitting across the gym. Our bench is way over there, and it is deafening loud. The whole game has been deafening loud. I can't even, I can't even hear myself think. I've got the ball, and, I'm, and at this point, I'm going to get double teamed, and I put the ball above my head, and they start coming in, and so I start leaning back, and they feel like they're coming in, and I'm leaning back. And in that moment, I can feel the ground shake because it is so loud in the gym. I could not hear my teammate who is feet away from me. I'm telling you, in that moment that the ball was above my head, I could hear someone's voice. Do you know whose voice I could hear? I could hear my coach's voice. And my coach was clear across the gym. And the reason I could hear my coach's voice is because my coach's voice was familiar. It was a voice that I knew the tone, I knew the rhythm, I knew exactly what it sounded like. And in that moment when I needed to hear my coach's voice, I heard my coach's voice. And the same is true for us. When God's voice is familiar, you never forget it. And it doesn't matter how loud the voices are around you. It doesn't matter how distracted you might be. If you know God's voice and God's voice is familiar to you, you will never forget it. I talked about this a little bit earlier. And I know it can, it can be challenging to understand how do we know it's the Holy Spirit in our life. But one of the ways that we can hear God's voice is through the power of the Holy Spirit that when you receive Jesus in your heart, it is living within you each and every day. And for some, that's when you come here and you listen to the music, for whatever reason, God's speaking in that. For others, you might just have a fleeting thought that goes across your mind. That's the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. The other way that we become familiar with God's voice is by reading God's word by getting into scripture because everything in God's word is God-breathed. That means it came from God and it is for us today. It is alive and breathing and God wants you to hear his voice above every other voice. There's another prophet in the Old Testament and his name is Habakkuk. He became a prophet not long after Jeremiah, and, and he cries out to God. And he's asking God, God, will you save the culture that we're living in? Will you please help them turn from what they're doing? Would you help the sin to decrease? God, I don't hear you. Like, God wasn't saying anything to Habakkuk for a while. He was silent. Have you ever been there? Where it's like God's voice is familiar, but you feel like you can't hear him because he's being silent. 
and he's asking you to wait, and he's asking Habakkuk to wait. We read that in the first chapter of Habakkuk, and then the second chapter of Habakkuk, because it's a book in the Old Testament, God speaks to Habakkuk. He doesn't change his circumstance, but he speaks to him, and he answers his questions. And then in chapter 3, it's amazing, Habakkuk shares all the praise. See, we oftentimes cry out to God to hear us and to answer us in our pain and our difficulty, but what would happen if you and I were increasing God's voice in our life? What if we waited patiently for him to speak and to answer? What would it be like to be like Habakkuk? Listen, in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, it says, Though the fig tree did not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I want you to understand, in their culture, the things that he was talking about are the things that they held so close for security. It was basic needs. It was food. <laughs> and he's saying, if, if we don't even have that, God, I'm still going to rejoice. Even if we don't have the things that help us with our livelihood, I'm going to rejoice. What would it look like if in your life God's voice was so familiar to you that you weren't shaken when other voices told you to go a different direction from God because you were rock steady in your rooted foundation with Jesus Christ. That his voice became louder than every other voice in your life. I want to encourage you Come back the next five weeks. Log in online the next five weeks. We are going to continue to unpack this idea of resilience that is countercultural. And I believe that it is going to build up our spiritual strength. It is going to help us have a spiritual strength like never before. It is going to help us in our spiritual maturity. And here's what I want you to know. Resilience, it's not my idea. <laughs> Resilience, it's not our church's idea. Resilience is God's idea. It's been his idea the entire time. God's story is a story of resilience, of spiritual strength, and all he wants, all he desires is your heart, your full heart. Not 80% of it, 90% of it, 99% of it. He wants 100% of your heart. And when he gets 100% of your heart, you know what happens? There's a reason we use the phrase follower of Jesus then he actually leads your life. That's the idea, is that Jesus Christ would be the leader of your life. Being a follower of Jesus means I'm following. And what would it look like if we built our spiritual strength? Let me say a prayer for us. After I pray, we're gonna sing a song in closing, a song called We Praise You. So let me pray. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our midst. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each life. I don't know all the details of everyone's story, but you do, God. And so would you help every single person lean in to this story and your story and help us to build this spiritual strength of resiliency. God, we trust you and we know that you are at work. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm gonna...